Okay. Apartment houses and office buildings have been the defining architectural elements of New York since the late 19th century. While office towers have gone higher and higher, it has only been very recently that apartment buildings have challenged the elevated offices for pieces of the sky. Until not very long ago, the measuring stick for apartments was luxury alone. Luxury of space, of grandeur, of intricacy and ornament, of privacy and of amenity. Many developers have vied for entry of their offerings into the pantheon of grand looks, but Edward Clark's project was the pioneer and was unquestionably the first truly luxury apartment house in New York. In size and significance, it was the top of the mountain. The Dakota was planned from the start to be a truly grand multiple dwelling on the newly developing Upper West Side. The descriptions told of luxury on a scale never before attempted. Architect Henry Hardenberg set the standard and he set it very high. The grandeur and luxury of the Dakota began right at the front door, which was much more than a mere door. It was an imposing arched and vaulted entrance driveway that led to a large internal courtyard with a pair of fountains around which the carriages of the residents and guests could turn. This was the sort of entrance that might be expected in a castle or a palace or at least a huge chateau or country house. Never before had it been seen in an apartment building in New York. The excavation and construction work of the Dakota began in October of 1880 and continued for almost exactly four years. The foundation walls were of bluestone, three to four feet thick, built 10 to 18 feet deep to rest on solid rock. The load-bearing walls of the building itself started out 28 inches thick at the first floor, gradually diminishing to 12 inches thick at the top. Rolled wrought iron beams with arched brick or terracotta infill formed the structural floors. Wood subfloors and elaborate parquet finished flooring atopped packed earth for soundproofing separated the feet of the residents from the structure itself. At the top of the building, there were many sloped roofs covered in slate shingles and trimmed with copper. But under the slate and its supporting sheets of wood were wrought iron joists, which can be clearly seen in this construction photo, probably taken in the summer of 1883. Here are the joists. There are some joists here, and you can just barely see some open joists here before the wood uh, roof was put on and then the slates were nailed on top of the wood. This front uh, feature is actually a pyramid, only they haven't gotten around to finishing yet. And of course there are no little dormers here and uh, you can see through to uh, a window on the other side here, no windows here. Um, notice uh, that 
you've got the basics of the building here, but uh, I would wager that inside the walls separating rooms probably hadn't been built yet. This appears to be the only progress photo of the project that survives. It is an ancient lantern slide that you can barely even read if you just look at the slide itself. Uh, a glass slide about that size um, that I found uh, in an antique shop and scanned and had to play with in Photoshop an awful lot to get it to read so that you could actually see what was going on. Uh, this um, statue of Daniel Webster uh, was uh, uh, set in place four years before they started uh, construction. It dates to 1876. It's still there. Uh, nothing on it has weathered. Everything is crisp. Even the lettering uh, here is just as crisp today as it was back then. Um, while the Dakota certainly wasn't the only construction project on the Upper West Side in the fourth quarter of the 19th century, it was a very significant one, as development in the neighborhood was spotty at best, with much of the land remaining vacant. Here is a pair of views looking southeast and southwest from the first section of what was to become the American Museum of Natural History. The photographs were taken about three years before construction on the Dakota began, and they show the area south of 77th Street. This is 77th Street here. This is 76th Street. This is Columbus Avenue. This is Central Park West. Only the interesting thing is, when this photograph was taken, Central Park West didn't exist. Eighth Avenue was what you would find here, and Ninth Avenue was what you would find here. Columbus Avenue and Central Park West didn't come in until about 1890. But what I find fascinating here is there's no elevated train here. The elevated train didn't get... Uh, constructed up here till late in 1877 or early in 1878, and it opened in 1879. That elevated train was what put the impetus to all the development that filled up all these blocks with buildings. Next. This pair of views looks in the opposite direction, north from the roof of the Dakota about 10 years later. Despite that passage of time, the view isn't all that different uh, from the view south. In the center is that lone beginning of the Natural History Museum. It shows up here and here. These are, of course, two completely separate uh, images. It's now buried within the complex, and it, it is invisible from the street. Central Park and Central Park West are at the right. You've got the beginnings of Central Park West here, but you don't have the uh, full wall that surrounds it yet. Um, and at the extreme left, all the way over here, is Columbus Avenue. And now you can see just barely the uh, elevated train right here is the 81st Street station of the 9th Avenue elevated train. And much of the development in evidence um, clusters near the 81st Street station of that modern rapid transit amenity. And it really was quite a modern rapid transit because it made it possible to build these rows uh, of brownstones here and uh, right on this corner, you have the Evelyn, uh, which went up in 1878, I believe, and is 
right now in the process of being converted uh, to rather expensive uh, condominiums. Uh, but at least it is a landmark, so it's going to remain. Uh, now we are looking west from the Dakota. The level ground down here at this side of this nice little picket fence uh, is something that was briefly called Clark Park to the west of the completed building, in the middle of which was the underground boiler house along with the dynamos that generated the electricity for the apartment house and also for the two rows of brownstone residences that Clark and Hardenberg built on the north side of 73rd Street. Here's one of them with a small apartment house here. And here's the other one that he built with another small apartment house. Both of these apartment houses are still there. This row is to a large extent still there, uh, but this row has disappeared except for the first brownstone, which is still there. Uh, all of this development was done by a different developer, uh, and the same with all of this. That's the Hudson River there. Um, this is, of course, the 72nd Street station uh, of the elevated train, which you can see much uh, better there. Uh, you'll notice that 73rd Street has been paved uh, because it has all of these houses, finished houses. It's got a sidewalk. 72nd Street has a sidewalk on both sides, but this certainly does not look like a paved street to me. Uh, while this is not the bustling Upper West Side uh, we know now, neither is it the wilds of the Dakota Territory. Uh, Clark had a curious affinity for the far western lands of our country and had promoted the name of Montana Place for what is now Central Park West. Uh, he suggested Wyoming Place for Ninth Avenue. Arizona place for 10th Avenue and Idaho place for 11th Avenue. When he was rebuffed, he settled on naming his new apartment building the Dakota, which was certainly not given to it according to the apocryphal anecdote about its distance from civilization. In fact, not only did such a story never appear in any contemporary accounts of the project, and I have read them all, the earliest mention I could find of it in print was in a 1933 report of a 50th anniversary celebration for the building, where its longtime manager idly speculated on the origin of the name. Christopher Gray opined that the reason the story was repeated so many times in exactly the same way was that nobody wanted to rock the quote. <laughs> That's Chris's pun, not mine. A major obstacle to West Side development was the rocky terrain. Here is the modern technology used to remove the rock around 81st Street and 9th Avenue. You've got a block and tackle. You've got a simple little horse-drawn wagon to move the rock. And right here, you have a fellow sitting on a pile of rock. And in his raised right hand, he has a hammer. And he's whacking away at the stone. Now, up here, uh, it looks as if they're dri possibly drilling and putting um, uh, possibly dynamite in there. Another way of uh, splitting is to open up a fissure and stick in a steel uh, wedge and then hammer the wedge until it splits. Kind of the way you might split a log that you're going to put in your fireplace. Uh, assuming you have a fireplace, and if you lived in the Dakota, you most certainly would. 
this is what resulted at points where the roadway grade uh, was much lower than the existing elevations of many of the houses. Uh, you are looking at the Brennan Farmhouse on 84th Street near Broadway where Edgar Allan Poe once lived. Uh, they had to build these rickety little stairs just to get up to uh, from the street down here, which is obviously not paved, uh, to get up to their home. And uh, I don't know, those people look like they might live there. Uh, these boys <coughs> sitting here, there's something about a young boy and a photographer back then. It was very unusual to see a photographer taking a picture and every little boy always wanted to go and be in the picture even though he'd never get to see it. So if you look hard at most of these early photographs, you'll find some little boy sitting in the corner. Next. At 81st Street and Columbus Avenue, where the elevated station is, the reverse was the case. The new roadway grade was higher than the surrounding land, so any developer there would have to build a deeper foundation to bring his building up to the level of the sidewalk. This happened all over the city. In some places it was very high, and the landowner would have to get rid of the uh, rock. In other places it was low, and uh, he'd have to fill it up. Well, luckily there was enough of this going on uh, that if he owned a couple of lots, he could get rid of the uh, stone in one and put it in the other and it would level out. Next, please. Despite the excavation problems, the Dakota rose and was the subject of an assignment from the Royal Institute of British Architects which sent a photographer to America to record the most modern buildings in New York for the benefit of its architect members, uh, so they could see what was being done over here. Here's the image that the UK chap recorded, probably in early 1884, when the open windows suggest that the painting and varnishing work was being carried out. The entrance gates have not yet been uh, installed, and the entrance lighting stanchions that were originally here have not yet been installed, but it appears that the iron railing all the way around, uh, as far as I can see, was installed. The Dakota was the first luxury apartment house, but it certainly wasn't the first apartment house or the only such project. The first one was the Stuyvesant on East 18th Street, built in 1869 and shown here in 1936. Its apartments were modest, but clearly they were more than mere tenements even though there was no elevator. This was the floor plan of one half of the Stuyvesant. Uh, if I reproduced it again right next to it, that would be the complete Stuyvesant. The entrance was on the ground floor right in the middle, and you went into a lobby, and you went in one direction to this stair hall, or in the other direction to get to the other one. What uh, made this one different, it had two apartments to each floor, is that it had a separate parlor and a separate dining room and a separate kitchen remote from everything else and even a little servant's room as well as three bedrooms and one bathroom way in the back. Um, this is the difference between a tenement, which is what there were lots of, and an apartment house. Not only did you have all of this amenity in the apartment, and certainly the apartment was much bigger than any tenement apartment, you had 
a stair hall in the front for uh, your residents and visitors, and a second service stair so that you wouldn't have uh, your servants and deliveries mixing in the front. You had, for each apartment, a small dumbwaiter. Now, you'll notice there's a closet here, some really minimal closets here. This bedroom has no closet. The servant's room, there's just one closet here, which maybe is a pantry for the kitchen, uh, but nothing else for the servant. Um, the servant probably had a couple of pegs on the wall, and that was sufficient. Um, for uh, a bedroom, you might have an armoire. Closets were not uh, um, used all that much. In 1876, the Albany was built on the west side of Broadway between 51st and 52nd Streets. It too was a walk-up with 10 apartments per floor, but with an attempt at providing middle-class accommodations. The planning was crude, however, with modest room sizes and many small air shafts providing the only light and air to the rooms that didn't face the street. Next, please. At the left, is the Albany's ground floor half plan showing the stores along Broadway and the entrance to half of the building. On the right is a typical upper floor. Its mirror image is over on the left. So it doesn't show the entrance, but it shows what the stair hall looks like on the upstairs. There's no elevator here. You've got a open staircase but what you also have is a second inside staircase accessible to each of the kitchens. Now that set it up separately. Um, and inside of each, there is a tiny dumbwaiter. This apartment got a little larger one. And there's one up here too. You have one, two, three, four, five apartments to each side, a total of ten on a floor. Now, the corner one is, of course, typically the better one, where you enter in the middle and you've got a parlor next to a dining room. So this is a little bit better than the ends of the hallway, and they're separated by sliding doors. So this is having a certain amount of elegance, and the dining room is convenient to the kitchen. Uh, there isn't any servant's room here, uh, because servants were uh, uh, provided for uh, uh, up on the roof and down in the basement. Um, uh, there are three bedrooms clustered together. This is a sink, a little extra sink. Uh, because the bathroom is all the way down here. You've got a long walk in the middle of the night. Now, this one at least has windows all the way around. But right next to it is one where the parlor has windows and one tiny bedroom. This bedroom doesn't have any windows at all. Uh, the dining room is on an air shaft. Well, that might be okay on the top floor, but by the time you get down to the second floor, there isn't going to be very much light there or air. Uh, and you've got the kitchen on that same air shaft. So I suspect uh, that uh, with that's the only <coughs> ventilation, uh, that's going to be pretty smelly around mealtimes. Uh, and then you've got these two bedrooms here, two bedrooms back here. Look at the walk that this person has to make to get to the bathroom. So you've got air shafts, small air shafts here, a larger one here, and a very much larger one here. 
So it's a step up uh, from what there was before, but there's a long way to go. Much grander, with a pair of large apartments on each floor, was the first Osborne on 5th Avenue, north of 52nd Street. It isn't there anymore, and it's not the Osborne that we know. This is a different one. It was built also in 1876, right next to the mansion of its developer. And its developer was a woman, which is very unusual for 1876. But she was a very unusual woman. She was the infamous lady abortionist known as Madame Restel. Next. Now we've jumped to something approaching luxury living. There are both front stairs and back stairs, a front elevator for residents and guests, plus a back service lift, as well as dumb waiters for each apartment. The rooms are more expansive, separated in some cases by sliding pocket doors. And besides the very spacious kitchens and pantries, there is decent provision in each apartment for two domestic servants. But this is only a relatively small mid-block building accommodating a total of 10 families. Of decidedly middle tensions was the 1880 Manhattan at 86th Street next to the 2nd Avenue Elevated Railroad. One time Mayor Robert F. Wagner Jr. grew up in this building. His father, Robert F. Wagner Sr., had been a New York State Senator and then a United States Senator. The Manhattan still exists but its interior has been completely rebuilt. A comparable but far more poorly planned three buildings at 57th Street adjoining the 9th Avenue elevated trains is the Windermere, now being reconstructed. It was designated by the Landmarks Preservation Commission as a supposedly luxury apartment house but it was very far from that even when it was brand new. And it couldn't rent its complete apartments. So almost immediately the units were turned into single room occupancy with the separate tenants sharing kitchens and bathrooms. Before long it deteriorated into a slum and remained nearly vacant for decades before the current owner bought it and has been attempting to find a way of economically converting it to a functioning structure. It reached this point because of overly zealous local activists who decided that it was a grand luxury apartment house and the very first one. And somehow they managed to convince our Landmarks Preservation Commission of that. Was it luxury? Well, maybe one apartment of it was. It's actually three buildings. This entire one is one building with an elevator and a staircase and a service elevator. Uh, it has an apartment here, an apartment here, which have reasonably decent lighting. And then the, in that building, there's an apartment here. Notice that these two bedrooms look out at a brick wall just a few feet away. Okay, the dining room and the kitchen have some decent air. The parlor looks out on 57th Street. It has another strange sitting room or chamber which looks out on this crack here, and another sitting room or chamber here. Look at that hallway. But it gets worse. Uh, this end building had two apartments to a floor. It has a staircase, and it has an elevator. 
The parlor is in the front. It's a decent size, 14 by 18. It has two windows. It opens on a bedroom. That bedroom opens on a little air shaft. And to get from this parlor to the dining room in the back, you have two choices. You can either go through the master bedroom, or you can go out into the public hallway and then re-enter the apartment. And look at this hallway. All the way back. There's no servant's room here, but you've got two very small uh, rooms here, another bedroom, and this bedroom. So you've got four bedrooms all opening onto air shafts. The same, this is comparable to this one. This building is a walk-up with no elevator, one apartment to a floor. The parlor is fine, but again, to get from the parlor to the dining room in the back, you either go through the master bedroom, which looks out on an air shaft, or you go out into the public hall and come back inside. I was in an apartment in this building. I had to walk very carefully because it no longer had floors, and I was walking on the joists. And they had already taken down all of the plaster work and the lathing, the wood lathing. So all I had to go on was the wooden joists in these two walls, but I took out my measuring stick. The width of this major corridor uh, hallway that connected the entire apartment was 28 inches. <laughs> Hardly luxury. Now, this one was seven stories high with no elevator. Uh, the building department discovered this. Um, maybe they stopped being paid off at that point. And they decided that the top two floors could not be rented out as a, uh, freestanding apartments because it was much too high to walk to get to them. So on the top two floors, the entire apartment was connected to this apartment so that this hallway was broken through at this point, I think at this point, uh, it got broken through and connected here. So you had a hallway for this apartment that went from here all the way up to there. No wonder they couldn't rent these apartments. Um, all right, the, this was the only halfway decent one. Uh, but this one, of course, looked out on the elevator. And at the time this was built in 1880, they had steam locomotives uh, drawing the uh, elevated trains. And they belched uh, smoke and soot and embers. Uh, and lots of apartments caught fire if the, uh, in, particularly in the summer, when the windows were open and uh, the curtains were flying in the breeze, and if an ember hit a curtain, it went up in flames. Now, quite different and originally uh, luxury was the Chelsea Apartments of 1883, three years later. It was an early form of co-op apartment house, but the winds shifted, and 20 years later, it became a hotel. And it, too, is now being reconstructed. Next. This was the typical original layout of the Chelsea when it was still an apartment house. It contained a pair of large, fully housekeeping apartments at the opposite ends of the building. A living room, dining room, a serious pantry, a very serious kitchen, a bedroom, a bedroom, a bedroom, a bedroom, and a servant's room, and one bathroom. That's what the 1880s was like. There was a slightly smaller apartment at the other end of the hall. And in between were smaller apartments um, uh, which did not have full cooking facilities
because the ground floor had a restaurant um, and a dining room for the residents. I think right from the start it was available uh, to the public. Uh, and it still is. There is still a restaurant there. And it's uh, still available uh, to uh, everyone. Um, even as an apartment house, the Chelsea was something halfway between a hotel and what we now know as an apartment house. And because perhaps that oddly hybrid character was what pushed its ultimate conversion to an ordinary hotel. A huge eight building complex known as the Spanish Flats or the Navarro from the corner of 7th Avenue and 59th Street here uh, for 40 years before being demolished. Its finances were so badly handled uh, that the original developer lost his shirt uh, and the holder of the mortgage took it over and completed the project as a rental. Um, next, please. Um, this slide shows the plan of one of the floors in the corner building with two apartments to a floor. On the upper floors, it was laid out as a huge single apartment. The usual aspect of the plan is that the ceiling heights of the rooms behind the public hall, uh, which faced the inner courtyard, was lower than those of the larger rooms facing the street. That meant that for every two levels of reception rooms on the street, there could be three levels of small service and bedrooms opening onto the courtyard. This squeezed more livable space into the same property footprint, thus yielding a greater potential profit for the real estate developer. Next. Two blocks away at 57th Street and 7th Avenue was the second Osborne, whose name reflected that of its developer, Thomas Osborne. His odd decision to name the building after himself, even though another apartment house was already using the same name, was reflected in his imprudent business decisions on the project. The result was that he, too, lost his building and his investment. The structure still exists as a very desirable co-op apartment house. Next. Here is the typical layout plan for the second now existing Osborne after its expansion to the west in 1910 and when some of the apartments had yet to be sub subdivided. It shows that there are two front stair halls, each with a passenger elevator and two service elevators and stairs in the back. The backs of the apartments have the same sort of lower ceilinged split floor arrangement as was done at the Spanish Flats. This was the necessary expediency to create sufficient numbers of bedrooms within a plot size that really was inadequate. Was it? Your piece of property. So except for the newly created duplexes that uh, owners have put together, all apartments are simplexes all on one floor without any steps to negotiate within the apartment units. None of those contemporary and predecessor apartment houses grandly luxurious Dakota, whose developer didn't have any financial problems because he used his own cash and had no no He had already bought the entire block on which he built the Dakota, as well as the entire block immediately to the north. And while the Dakota was under construction, he created an instant neighborhood by building two very long rows of large 
and well-constructed brownstone row houses, all let out as rentals to provide a cash flow for the larger project. He was proving to be a very sophisticated builder. Clark's ultimate plans uh, <clears throat> for the land to the west, next please, uh, doubtless were in his head, but they were thwarted by his death in 1882 in the middle of construction. Because of the totally plain brick western facade of the building that you can see here, it is obvious that he had in mind to construct another comparable building atop the Clark Park site once the Dakota was completed and producing a cash flow. It's the only explanation that I can come up with for why this western facade was totally unadorned. Next. The site plan of the Dakota block shows the new building with the space for the additional building to its west. Next. We cannot know what Clark and Hardenberg's next building would have been, but we certainly know what their prior building was. The Van Corlear was the testing ground for their ideas about luxury housing. It was built in 1879 on the west side of Sixth Avenue from 55th Street to 56th Street. It was replaced in the 1920s by the large hotel that is now on that site. Next. This apartment house improved significantly on the nearby Albany of three years earlier. It was of apartments per floor down to six and subdivided the structure in the middle, as the Albany did, so that there were only three apartments on each floor for each of the two sections. Clark at the left and Hardenberg made a very astute team and produced many of the features they would subsequently improve upon for the Dakota. Next. Of the Van Corlear was a mirror image of the other with no ground level stores, a clear indication of luxury. Each side, this is the ground floor side showing the entrance hall. This is an upper floor, but each side had a large open staircase and an elevator. Um, but in addition, each apartment had access to a service stair, a dumbwaiter here. And also in the service stair was a tiny water closet for the servant or a delivery boy. Um, there, the major difference you see is a single large courtyard. And this open court, and the same one over here, are not ordinary light shafts. This apartment here is entered by this passageway, which has windows on both sides, and it's low ceilinged. So it's open above and open below, so that this little courtyard is completely connected to this courtyard for light and air. This was brilliant planning that nobody had ever done before. He introduced a ramp from the street that went down and into the courtyard for deliveries. And the boiler room was outside the building instead of in the basement. There were an awful lot of boiler explosions and horrendous fires in tenements and uh, very early apartment houses. So I think more as a rental uh, gimmick, uh, a real necessity for safety, he 
put the boiler out there. The rooms were more and numerous, and the arrangements more and practical than the other early apartment houses. Uh, the corner ones, for example, you in here with a little bit of a vestibule and a front closet, and you have a relatively short hallway, but you come right into the library the living room to get to the dining room and the two bedrooms here. This is really rather well planned. Uh, it's not quite the Dakota, but it's very close. Now, when he came to the Dakota, he used uh, or they, I should say, because it's pretty evident that they worked very closely with each other. Uh, you have a much larger courtyard. Of course, the uh, plot size is double what it was on 7th Avenue. But here you have the uh, astounding thing that this courtyard is at grade level. The entrance is right here from 72nd Street that's vertical. Uh, and the carriages of the residents and their guests would come into this courtyard down a ramp and into the basement would come the delivery wagons and the servants and they would the wagons would come all the way into a courtyard below this one of exactly the same dimension it just has some columns in it but it's lighted by two huge skylights that at this level double as fountains and they still operate. And the skylights still work, and they create a lot of space in the lower courtyard, which I've been in, uh, except that courtyard is no longer accessible uh, to run delivery wagons. Um, this shows the planning they did in the Dakota that is so astounding. You would come in here on the ground floor, and then you would go to four separate stair halls with elevators. Now, on the ground floor, of course, you don't get this much stair. You only get one piece of stair. So you have a small lobby. You've got four small entrance lobbies as opposed to what we're used to now, a building of this size would have a monster lobby uh, that you would go down to get to the four elevator uh, banks, if that's what you had. That kind of planning was very carefully done because the market for these apartments would be people at a level who would otherwise have been living in a brownstone. So he made this a huge, magnificent palace until you got into it. And then he made it as close as possible to a brownstone. So when you got up in the elevator, the entrance doors to your apartment looked and felt just like the entrance doors to your old brownstone that you used to live in. And when you came into the apartment, the sizes of the rooms, the ceiling height, the uh, woodwork, the fireplaces, everything felt like a really grand brownstone, but there were no stairs. And you could live all on one floor, uh, which made it much easier to live in. Uh, Clark designed one, uh, had Hardenberg design one apartment for himself, which he never got to live in, but his family used. And that is the apartment number 62. This obviously was added, and what is now 61 were additional bedrooms. And his living room was the biggest living room with two freestanding columns. This still exists as a living room and a dining room, but now there's just uh, uh, three bedrooms. I think this one is being used as a library. So you end up with only two. And here is the kitchen and service space. It's possible, I have no way of telling, 
that this room and this room could have also been part of that apartment, but there are no plans uh, to indicate that. Next. The Dakota's masterful planning and superb execution proved to be a success, and it represented the best that New York had to offer its upper classes in the way of an alternative to overly expensive and vexatious private house living. This lithograph, published in 1894, reinforces that business model, at least during the warm months of the year. And of course, there is our completed Dakota. Uh, there's still a roadway here, uh, but I don't think these methods of transportation there anymore. Next. And this 1886 woodcut provides the comparable winter view of that segment of New York's population with the still extant Daniel Webster in the foreground and the snow-trimmed Dakota in the background. I like the artist's imaginary, very chic looking, very well dressed, very prosperous people in his woodcut. Next. The summertime view of the Dakota across the great Central Park Lake is a splendid and much photographed one. This is a rare one because it shows the north side of the Dakota. Most of the photographs do not show that. It can be dated because it's showing the first piece of the San Remo Hotel, uh, which was uh, built in the winter of, uh, or spring of 1895, and the following winter, the south half of it uh, was built. What you might not be able to see is this chap in a straw boater leaning on the little bridge. I had this photograph, which I had uh, found in an antique shop, uh, badly framed. It's an original photograph he had. Uh, and I had it for quite a while before I noticed that that fellow was there. Next. But much more vibrantly alive is the same view when the lake is sufficiently frozen to permit ice skating. This view shows how overwhelmingly the Dakota dominated the skyline just outside the park when it was first built. By virtue of its size and distinctive profile, it was an instant <coughs> landmark. Next. But one by one, the Dakota gained neighbors as the lots and block fronts along Central Park West were developed. First, the Hotel Majestic was built to the south, actually here. And uh, then the Barnard Apartments uh, south of that. And then the Hotel San Remo. Here's that first piece of it. Uh, and then came the Langham. In, uh, here, here was the completed San Remo with its two towers. And here is the Langham, rather fancifully hand colored for the postcard to make it look as if it were uh, made of red brick, which of course it isn't. Um, uh, that was uh, um, built in 1906, immediately to the north of the Dakota, on land that the Clark family had finally sold. Uh, uh, old Mr. Clark had bought it uh, in 1878 uh, or 79, I forget. I was very young at the time, so I didn't remember. Around 1930, both the Majestic and the San Remo hotels were replaced with the buildings that we now know by uh, that name. Next. Let's take a flying tour of the Dakota in our personal drone. The top of the building is probably the most complex roofscape in the entire city, surrounding the central courtyard. Each of those little dormers originally lighted a servant's room or a private laundry or other service space. Now they all form part of the co-op apartments 
that have been created uh, from those service rooms that have very hefty price tags associated with them. Next. Descending to the courtyard, we see one of the fountain skylights to the basement and the stairs to one of the four corners, one of the four corner lobbies. What we also see is a granite paver uh, roadway and a bluestone sidewalk, which went up only about a dozen years ago. They have no idea what the original was because it had been replaced with cheesy make-do uh, coverings. And uh, when they realized that they were leaking like a sieve, and they looked up from the basement and saw that some of the steel supporting beams looked more like a lace, uh, they decided that maybe they'd better do something about it. Uh, so they came up with this scheme um, uh, from the imagination of the architect and the consultant and the landmarks people because they could not find any original photographs or drawings that told them what was there in 1884. But what they put in certainly looks as if it had always been there. This gate also looks as if it had always been there. And this gate is not more than 10 years old. There wasn't any gate here originally. Uh, you didn't have the security problem uh, that you have today. Next. Flying our drone over that gate that's here, uh, we now see the vaulted entrance carriageway with a modern carriage discharging its passengers. Now, this is the front gate, which was rebuilt. This portion of it, part of it is new. Uh, we know it. The bulk of it is, in fact, uh, original. Uh, these light fixtures are not original. That's pretty obvious. But this is the original vaulting. This is sandstone. And just like tiles is, in fact, just tiles. And these arches are structural, and they are built up without any centering to support them while they're being built. And they consist of, of three of these very thin to each other by a particularly strong Portland cement. It is an astounding method of construction. It can span huge distances. It sets up very, very quickly and admittedly a little thicker with five layers instead of three. The entire crossing of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine is a dome made of these tiles. It was guaranteed for, I think, and it was put up in 1895. I think guarantee. Next. And north facades in all their grandeur with 30 majestic at the left and the corner of the 1906 Langham at the right. Next. This is the entrance along 72nd Street. The two pairs of wall-mounted lanterns, uh, gas, are not original. They replaced large torchairs on pedestals, flanked the entrance, but were later moved to the curb and still later removed entirely when the street was widened. That's the point where they built these. And the cast iron urns are also not original, but they are sitting on the original pedestals for those torchairs. The doorman's sentry box here, which looks as if it's original, 
wasn't. This is the second one, replacing an earlier flat-topped wood that had been installed around 20. Next. This is the best-known camera angle for viewing the building, showing the south and east facades with the 1964 white brick Mayfair Tower sitting on the site of the original boiler house, which later became tennis courts and then was used as a giant parking lot. A close-up of the original, uh, of the entrance lanterns and the domed and finialed room at the top of one of the two curved orioles that extend from the second to the ninth floor on the south facade. Next. At the left, a two-story oriel in the middle of the Central Park West facade of the building, and at the right, a comparable central feature on the south facade at 72nd Street. Next. At the central table in the middle of the 72nd Street facade is a graceful ornamental terracotta frieze. Um, <clears throat> that is surmounted by a continuous balcony with an exceptionally handsome and artfully wrought decorative iron railing. And the only people who really get to enjoy it are the people whose windows open out onto it. You really can't see it from the street. And in the center, surveying his territory, is a presumably Dakota Indian, along with the date when the building itself was begun following completion of the foundation work. Next. And finally, the iconic image that most represents the Dakota, because it appears so many times all around the building along the iron railing that protects the dry moat, which in turn itself from all who might do it harm. Thank you. Uh, I would be delighted if you had any questions. I would only hope that I could provide answers. Sir. Who is that? Who is that? Neptune. Neptune, a green man. Uh, a friend of mine took another photograph of him from the side and put it next to a photograph he took of me from the side. <laughs> so I'd like to believe that maybe it's a, a, a futuristic version of me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What was the number of bathrooms that the apartments had? Because the predecessor buildings all had only one bathroom. Uh, it depends on the size of the uh, apartment. Uh, where there was a servant's room by the kitchen, of course, the servant had a separate bathroom. It was minimal, uh, but it was separate. It didn't count. Um, uh, j depending on the number of bedrooms, it might have had one or it might have had two uh, originally. They added bedrooms. Each apartment is different because, curiously, uh, this building was pre-rented. While can, uh, uh, a way that they do it even today. Uh, but uh, with Clark, uh, because the actual construction took so long, just because of the technique of the construction, he was getting people to line up uh, uh, and, and sign leases with him over a much longer period than you would do today. So that if you signed a lease, he would be open to the idea of moving walls, adding rooms from one apartment to another, changing things to suit you. And uh, when that happened, I think uh, um, the complement of, of bathrooms changed. Today, we treat bathrooms very differently. In the 1880s, using a bathroom was something that was acknowledged it's necessary. You can't live without one. Uh, but you didn't uh, um, fuss about it. You certainly didn't talk about it. 
And if you could manage it, you didn't even think about it. You just did whatever you had to do there and got out of it. It was minimal from our standards. Gra oh, oh it, to support that, in some of the closets adjoining uh, the bedrooms, there would be a small sink set into a marble counter. And you can find them to this day in old brownstones between bedrooms. You'd have that. That would take some of the uh, pressure off the bathroom. Uh, also, the head of the family uh, would get dressed and uh, have breakfast. And on his way to the office, he would stop in at his barber shop. And his barber would shave him. So he didn't have to shave uh, uh, at home. And um, they weren't quite as obsessed with cleanliness and bathing as we are. Uh, so you were lucky uh, if you got to take a bath once or twice a week. Uh, it must have been interesting riding the subway uh, in those days uh, when there was no such thing as a summer weight suit. So you had a heavy wool suit that you wore in the summer. And at 5 o'clock going home, I cannot imagine what the place must have smelled like. Yes, Annie. Yeah, the, um, the interior walls would not have been load-bearing. Uh, uh, some of the interior walls were load-bearing. Some were not. Um, even a load-bearing wall, you could cut a uh, arched opening for a door in the wall uh, have a problem. The arrangement of the iron beams went from load-bearing wall to load-bearing wall, and they were in various places. Uh, so some of them were, in fact, room walls. Some of them were outside uh, uh, walls. Yes? The hydraulic elevators, were they ever replaced with conventional? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, sadly or thankfully, depending on your viewpoint. Uh, I remember the original hydraulic ones. I was a little boy and was terribly impressed. I'd never seen anything like that before. I was used to the usual rheostat with a handle on it, and you moved it clockwise to make the elevator go up, or counterclockwise to make it go down. That's what our apartment house had. But there, uh, and, and we didn't have elevator operators as the Dakota did, their operators were all women, they were all Irish, and they all looked like Schraft's waitresses. <laughs> they wore black dresses trimmed in lace. And instead of the electric rheostat, all there was was a an, an, uh, steel cable that went out of the floor and into the ceiling. And there was a little protective uh, piece of pipe so you wouldn't trip over it. So you had this piece of cable <coughs> with little knobs on the cable. And when it was time to start the elevator, she closed the door. It was a wooden door with spindles. And she'd pull down on the cable. And that would open the valve, and the water would come from a huge tank on the roof and come down a pipe and force the elevator up. And uh, when it, she wanted to stop it, she would grab a hold of that cable and pull it in the opposite direction. That's what the little knobs were for, to give her something to grab a hold of. And the skill, which absolutely astounded me, was that she would stop it at just the right point. So as it slowed down, it came to a stop at precisely the floor level. Well, we didn't get that again until we got computer-controlled electric elevators. Well, they finally replaced the elevators with electrical ones in new, new cabs, in the same shafts, of course, uh, when the building went co-op in 1961. Uh, the work on the elevators <coughs> wasn't done until a couple, 
couple of years uh, later. So if you go in there, it's still a nice, large, wood-paneled elevator, uh, but there's a standard uh, panel with uh, push buttons uh, in it. Yes? Uh, did many of the tenants stay on and purchase their units? Or, um... I don't know the numbers, but I know there were many tenants who did stay on. Uh, there was one longtime tenant, an eccentric woman, who had been living in the largest apartment in the building on the ground floor in the southwest corner of the building. She'd been living there with her brother, and they had been very rich at one point. Uh, her brother, a very odd bird, who was <laughs> ostensibly an inventor. Um, and a collector of um, armor. And he had a full suit of armor. Uh, and it wasn't enough just to have a full suit of armor sitting there. He got a hold of a horse had, uh, that had died, had it taxidermied, and they set it up in uh, the entrance foyer. And they put the uh, mounted uh, fellow in armor on top of the horse. And uh, you could see it if things were right from the street. So it became known as the house with the horse in it. Um, by the time it went co-op, the brother had died. And she said she simply could not afford to buy the apartment. Uh, she was paying minimal rent. Uh, because when the Clarks owned it as a rental, they almost never raised your rent. Uh, it, they had other money. They weren't looking at it as a profit center. Um, uh, so what the co-op did was they found a smaller apartment for her, and they moved her into that apartment. And then they sold uh, the apartment. Um, and they ended up selling it to a restaurateur who had the Cattleman restaurant on East 46th Street, I think it was, uh, Larry Ellman, who died uh, less than a year ago. He bought the entire apartment. It was much too big for him. So he chopped off about 40% of it and turned it into the only maisonette in the building with its own private entrance from the courtyard. And that 40% of the original apartment changed hands fairly recently for, I think it was 22 or $23 million. Well, I think that proves that there is no, nothing that Andrew Alpern doesn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> so let's thank him again. <laughs> So now that it's after, um, just barely after 6.30, I'll begin the introduction um, of Andrew Alpert, who is um, coming for the second time. Uh, so he's doing a two-peat and follows Andrew Dolcard, who last month did a three-peat performance at the Sky Theater Museum. Uh, but Andrew's book, which uh, I've just discovered is not on our shelves anymore, but has been, I swear, until last week. Apparently, we just sold the last few editions of Holdout. Uh, which is a delightful book about the people who own buildings who are in the way of development and refuse to submit to the uh, predations or enterprise of, of developers. And it's, it's really a delightful book that um, is illustrated from both the knowledge and the, um, the collecting passion that Andrew has for arcana as well as images. Uh, and it's a really good representation of his knowledge of development uh, in, the, in the city and, and the energies and the legal aspects that, uh, that fold into to that process. Because Andrew Alpern is uh, trained as an architect. He has worked as a lawyer. Uh, he's been a historian of New York City history, but most particularly in the um, categorical type of apartment buildings. And this is one of his books from, it was a very early photograph of you in this, uh, <laughs> 19, was it 80s or 90s? This yeah. one yeah. came out. Oh, I'll yeah. show you without a beard. Uh, 
uh, and with like somewhat um, darker hair in the, in the front of luxury apartment houses in Manhattan. Uh, and then there's another version of that um, apartment houses, and he's still working on apartment houses with uh, this new book on the Dakota, which of course is the history of the world's best known apartment building, and I, I think there probably aren't too many challengers for the punitive uh, um, description of the world's most, most well, best known, if not most famous or yes. notorious, might be another In way some to ways, that. Yes. So, um, because I know that he has a, a practice 53-minute talk for us tonight, I'm going to get off the stage and start <laughs> talking to you right now. 